Hello and welcome to Core Salvation Part 2. My name is Pastor Jay and I am here with Leah Bloom. And we are so glad that you all are joining us for the second part of our Core Salvation class where you can know for sure that you are saved, that you are a child of God, and that your salvation is secure. So this class, we want to start off just by kind of quickly reviewing what we talked about in the last class, the five foundational truths. I'm not going to go through all of them, but the real key there is just knowing, like 1 John 5, 13 says, that God gives us these things so that we can know that we have eternal life. He wants us to know that our eternal life with him is secure. Um, but the main thing is that the gospel changes everything. It all starts with Jesus. All we have to do is believe and confess. And then it ends with you being made new. So you are new, just like 2 Corinthians 5, 17 said, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away and all things have become new. So you are new. All right, so we're going to get you thinking a little bit before we get started. Got to get those wheels turning. So I just want you to think for a minute, and you can use the chat box to put any of your answers as we go throughout. So if I'm asking you to you know, think or answer, then type those in the chat box. We'll also have a time for questions at the very end mm -hmm. of class, too, where we'll answer more of those questions in that chat box, since we can't be with you in person, sadly. So, again, so I'm going to have you think. So think about something that maybe in the past was quote-unquote old mm -hmm. that has a newer version today. So, for example, maybe I would say the old is a home phone, which mm. was, you know, I was probably like maybe 10 when those started phasing out. <laughs> That's my whole high school life is <laughs> yes, being on exactly. a home phone. Oh. You only could have one line at a time or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I briefly remember that. So let's say we Thanks. have home phone as the old and then we have cell phone as the new. Jay, do you have an example of old versus new? I do. As you're sitting here talking, I'm thinking about, about my past and growing up as a kid. We had a really old TV, you know, the one that had the two knobs, and it was like th the channels 3, 10, and 13 on one knob. And you had oh, 27 and 33 <laughs> on the other knob if you grew up in the Hampton Roads area, UHF, VHF, mm -hmm. all of that. And we had this old TV. And then you move forward, you know, a decade or so, and then I had my first high-def TV. Um, that was a 32-inch Panasonic, but it weighed like 8,000 pounds. And me and my cousin, who, were, who was a football player, it took both of us to move it. And now I have a 65-inch TV that I can move by myself because it's flat screen yeah. and it's thin and it's light and all of that stuff. So just watching that transition in TVs is, uh, is pretty cool. And I probably gave away my age talking about the, the two-knob TV. Definitely. Yeah, well, <laughs> womp womp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so take a moment, and I'm excited to see what y'all come up with. So think of old versus new and type it in the chat box. I miss my old TV. Yeah. Yeah, it was nice. It was nice. The good old days. Yeah, I was the remote for my grandmother. She'd say, hey, boy, change the channel, and that was me. I always wanted a home phone that was pink to mm. go in my bedroom. Okay. But then cell phones came out, and I went with that. My home phone in my bedroom, my cord from the from the base to the phone was so long because I would stretch it out. It was like the little. <laughs> the yeah. ringlet one? Yeah, it was horrible. It was horrible. <laughs> so what did y'all come up with? And you might be asking, okay, what's the point of this? And Jay mentioned earlier, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Again, it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So the point here is that we have old versus new. Mm -hmm. And we are made new in Christ. And we want to make it clear that we're going to list off a couple things that are the new you today. Mm -hmm. So we're going to list those out. But also, not all of this happens overnight. Right. Just like a home phone didn't turn into a cell phone overnight, right. there were some steps in between. So, you know, you had car phones along the way. I remember having, I really wanted a Blackberry. Like, I know it's like, <laughs> I was a, you know, teenager. Why did I need a Blackberry? I don't know. You were but a corporate teenager. Yeah, I was a corporate teenager. I just thought they were really cool. And then we had like little razor flip mm -hmm. phones. So there was a lot of changes along the way. So Christ has made us new from the day of salvation, but he is constantly changing us. And we're going to talk about that spiritual journey. And he's constantly changing us until the day that we are called home. Yeah, and we're going to give you guys some resources. I'll uh, show one at the end, a resource that you can use to help you along on your journey. Um, and we'll have some resources pop up on the screen as well. But again, feel free to ask questions in the chat box. We're going to ask you some questions as well. But just kind of jumping back to that spiritual journey. Again, this is not an 
overnight thing. Now, you may experience an overnight change when you get saved. I've heard stories of people who, you know, they were alcoholics and they trusted Christ and the desire for alcohol completely went away. I've heard of that happening, but that's more rare um, than it is the norm. So don't worry if you're a person where these changes happen slowly. Um, don't, don't make that scare you or make you think that you're not saved. We're being made new, and that process is called sanctification. That's a big word. But um, it's called being sanctified or set apart, being made holy or being made more like Christ. So don't let that scare you. But that spiritual journey, again, starts with salvation. And remember from part one, you are on this trek trying to get to that top of that spiritual maturity mountain. But even when you get there, that's not the final destination, you know. Scripture says that, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. That's from Philippians chapter 1. But what that means is that this journey is going to continue until either A, you go home to be with Jesus, or B, Jesus comes back to get you, whichever happens first. This journey is going to continue until then. So it's, it's kind of a, a never-ending journey yes. in that way. Keeps going. So... so. Go ahead and take a couple moments here. Again, we're going to ask you to think a lot in this class. <laughs> so think about how do you know that you are saved? So what are some things that makes you know that you are saved? Also, what happens when you believe and confess in Jesus? So take a couple moments. You can write those in the chat box or you can just think about them. So the point here is that there is evidence of that change. Mm -hmm. So we're saying we're being changed, and again, it may not happen all right overnight, but there is going to be evidence along the way. Absolutely. So for instance, um, I mentioned in Salvation Part 1, if you were with us, that I grew up in church. So I grew up going to church, and at a very young age, I came to a saving knowledge of Christ. And mm -hmm. You know, I was about five um, at that time. So really, I'm when I look back, I'm like, okay, did I really understand? Like, you know, I was like, okay, maybe I lied about, you know, writing my name with crayon on the wall. Definitely mm, did that. I knew that. We um, <laughs> so I, I was like, you know, what, what really did I do, quote unquote, wrong when I was only five years old? And that was a real struggle oh, for a long time with me because as I was you know, older, I was like, really, did I accept Christ way back at five? How did I understand? But when I look back, I can see that I had a conviction when I did something wrong. So when I was sinning, for instance, I was telling Jay about this before we got started. I have a little sister, Katie, if you're watching. Hi. Hi, Katie. <laughs> Hi, Katie. Um, she is about six years younger than me. So we would play Monopoly Junior. Mm. And it was like the little lemonade stand one. And I would be like, oh, Katie, like, look over there. And I would just take money from the bank, you know? <laughs> basically, basically would rob the bank in Monopoly. <laughs> and, you know, during the time playing the game, I was like, oh, this is, an, it's kind of harmless. This is fun. Thing. Yeah. And it makes me win. So cool. But I just remember, like, I, I'm not going to lie and say, I mean, I definitely did that more than one time. And, but every time, I would feel bad after. Yeah. And it wasn't just a, oh, I feel a little bit guilty. It was a deeper conviction. And now I can look back and I can say that that was Christ and the Holy Spirit pressing on me, being like, that's wrong. You're lying to your sister. Mm. You're lying to yourself saying it's okay. And I had that deep conviction. And looking back, like I said, now I can see that was evidence that Christ was in my life in that point. Yeah, and she repented. I mean, we had a whole time of confession here this morning. And, it was uh, a big just, deal. It was a big deal, you know. And, and honestly, Monopoly has been destroying families <laughs> since 19. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, yeah, be careful, Monopoly, be careful. Um, you know, but that, that's a good point, Leah, because there is a change that happens in us when we are made new. And you know, as a five-year-old, that change may not feel as big. You may mm -hmm. not see these drastic changes. And you know, and I've seen people who, and we all hear, we live in a culture where you want to have the best story. and We kind of try to one-up one another. And so you hear these stories about people who were drug dealers or drug addicts and they were- Or actual bank robbers. Or actual <laughs> bank robbers or murderers and they were strung out and then they come to Jesus and now they're preachers. And you hear those stories and you're like, man, my testimony sucks mm -hmm. because- you know, I didn't really do anything wrong. I, I, I just lived kind of a normal life. But you needed Jesus just as much as that bank, that actual bank robber. Mm -hmm. um, because either way, both of you were on your way to hell apart from Jesus. And now through Jesus, you're on your way to spending eternity with him and being made new 
while you're here on earth. And so that's what, kind of what we're going to talk about today is this process of what the new you looks like um, and just see some of what's going to happen in your life now that you've trusted Christ as your Savior. So we'll start off the new you. One of the first types of evidence you'll see in your life is that the new you is going to produce spiritual fruit. Um, Galatians 5, through 23 tells us about the fruit of the Spirit. I'm going to ask Leah to read that for me. And you can follow along on the screen. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And so when you think about those fruits of the Spirit, I want to ask you a question. That I just want you to take two seconds to process. How many of those things come naturally to you? Are you naturally kind? Are you naturally loving? Are you naturally gentle? And if you're honest with yourself, I think you will discover that those fruits of the Spirit are not natural things for mm -hmm. us. You know, typically we're selfish. We want things our way. We're not as loving as we'd like to claim that we are on our own. But when you trust Christ and his Spirit comes to live in you, those fruits begin to develop in you. You become more loving. You become more gentle, more patient. I was definitely not patient before Christ. But, you know, he's had to work on me quite a bit to make that patience happen. Um, so those fruits of the Spirit are evidence of a new you, that you're being made new in Christ. Um, a second evidence is that you're convicted when you sin. And this is what was happening in Leah's story. You know, little 10-year-old or 11-year-old Leah who was taking money out of the Monopoly bank was having this, this guilt. And Scripture calls it godly sorrow that leads to repentance. She was having this in her heart saying, you know what, I need to make this right with my sister. I've lied. I've transgressed God's law. She may not have used those words, but I've Definitely. broken God's law. Definitely not transgressed, <laughs> right? But I've broken God's law. I've lied to my sister. I need to make this right. Um, and so there will be conviction when you sin. And I remember as a, as a teenager talking to my mom, and, I, and I, got, I trusted Christ when I was nine, so I was pretty young as well. But I remember as a teenager having a conversation with my mom about a relative of mine. And I'm like, you know, everything that this person does wrong, every time they do X, Y, Z, they go on with their life and they're happy and it never seems to bother them. But if I make, you know, one little mistake, I tell one little small lie and I feel miserable. And my mom said, son, you should only worry if you don't feel that way. And she was teaching me a very valuable spiritual principle. And that is conviction is a godly thing. When you feel that conviction in, in the book of Hebrews, it says that the Lord disciplines every son that he receives, every son that he loves and calls his own, he will discipline. And that conviction is the discipline of God in your life. It's, it's one of those things where you can't sin and just get away with it, <laughs> you know, as much yeah. as you would like to. You're going to feel that, that remorse, that guilt, that godly sorrow that leads to repentance. Um, and, it, and it can come across, it can feel negative, but it's actually a very positive thing. The third thing is, for the new you, is that you're going to begin to desire God and the things of God. And Colossians chapter 3 talks to us about this a little bit. Leah, can you read that for us? If then you have been raised with Christ, seek things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. So Psalm 37, 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the, the desires of your heart. And I love that passage of scripture. I used to read it and think all I have to do is like Jesus and I'm going to get everything <laughs> I want. Like I'm going to have a new car and a new house. I do like Jesus. So, but that's not what that scripture means as much as I would like it to mean that. Mm -hmm. That's not what it means. It means that if you take the light in God, so if, if God is your focus, if he's your heart desire, then he's going to put his desires in your heart. So you'll begin to desire the things that he wants. You'll have compassion on the people he has compassion on. Uh, you'll love the way that he loves. And you'll begin to think as much as humanly possible the way that he thinks. You'll, you'll have a desire to do his will. Um, which leads you into the fourth thing about the new you. And that is that you're going to experience a new purpose. And that new purpose comes out of that desire to do God's will. You're going to have a new purpose. And I want you to think for a moment about what your purpose looked like prior to Jesus. And if you're like me, like I said, I trusted Christ when I was nine, but if you've ever heard me share my story here at church, um, you'll know that in my late teenage years and early 20s, I walked away from God. And I think what was happening in my own life is that even though I, I trusted Christ at nine, and even though I felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit that entire time, God took me through a period of making my faith my own. And I kind of had to hit rock bottom a little bit in order for him to show me 
my need for him um, to a degree because growing up in church the way that I did and memorizing all the scripture that I did and everything, I was kind of arrogant and kind of cocky and kind of uh, judgmental. And, and God had to show me that he was the one that was keeping me and that left to my own devices, I was really going to struggle. And during that period of struggle, my purpose was all about me. It was about fulfilling uh, the desires of my flesh, not fulfilling God's call to the point that I actually felt like I forfeited everything God wanted to do in my life. Um, and then he drew me back to himself. But I want you to think for a moment, what was your purpose like before Christ? What were you pursuing? And then what are your pursuits now? What are you pursuing after you've come to know Christ? And there should be some change there. Um, there should be less focus on you and more focus on him, less focus on the things that bring you glory and more focus on the things that bring him glory. Uh, Leah, can you read from the book of Matthew for us? All right, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. All right, so Christ gave us a command. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. In church lingo, you will hear that referred to as the Great Commission. So anytime you hear Pastor John or one of the other pastors talk about the Great Commission, this is what we're referring to. And that Great Commission is to go and make disciples. And then under that idea of, of going and making disciples, that command to go and make disciples, we're told to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit and teach them to obey all that Christ has commanded. So we have a command to go make disciples and then a sub-command, if you will, to baptize and teach. And so this great commission is God's purpose through us. This is what he wants us to do. And once you trust Christ and the new you um, starts to form into his image, you'll have a desire to do those things, to go and make disciples. You'll have a desire to share your faith. Uh, speaking of which, if you um, struggle with that, we have a core class for that as well. Uh, but, you know, you'll have a desire to read scripture and we have a core class to teach you how to do that. You'll have a desire to pray and talk with God and we have a core class that'll teach you how to to do that as well. So what we really tried to do here with core classes is create some instruction for spiritual fundamentals to help you fulfill these things that God has called you to do. But enough of that promo back to the, the <laughs> salvation class. But you'll have a desire to do the things that God has laid out for us. And every believer has this command to go and make disciples. It may look different for each of us. You know, as a pastor, that for me, that may look like what I do here at the church, whereas if you work at the shipyard, it may be, you know, just being salt and light in the environment that you're in. So it's a little different for each of us, but we all have that command from Jesus to go out and do that. So the new you is going to produce spiritual fruit. Um, the new you is also going to be convicted when you sin, and please don't miss that one. That, that's a really big one. Um, the new you is going to have a desire for God and the things of God. So you'll notice your appetite starts to change. Um, you know, one of the biggest changes I noticed personally is that things that I could watch and listen to before, I no longer have an appetite for it. You know, something will come on TV that, you know, 20 years ago I would have been okay watching. And now I'm like, this just doesn't feel right. This isn't for me. And I'll turn it off. You'll have some of those changes in your life. And that's a good thing. Um, but those appetites will begin to change. You're going to experience a new purpose. You're going to feel God lead you in a new direction based on his purpose and not your own. And, and a, that will tie back into the great commission that Leah read from Matthew 28, 18 through 20, um, where you'll just have a desire to fulfill his will in your life. Yeah, so take a few moments here and just take this time to self-reflect a little bit. Think about um, any evidence that you may have seen in your life. And outside of this class, a good place to, if you're kind of struggling, reflecting on your own life, you could also ask people that are close to you, see if they've seen any changes in you mm -hmm. or any evidence that they could be like, yes, you're a much more patient person now. So you could always do that outside of class too. I find that that helps to see what other people's viewpoint is too. Um, but right now, just take a few moments to reflect on your own life. And can you think of any specific examples of maybe something you would have done in the old you versus the new you? And I think that's a good reflection to have. Um, and don't, don't ignore small things. Don't ignore things that you may consider insignificant. You know, a lot of times these changes are day by day. They're not major overnight things. Uh, so if you notice that there are things that used to really upset you that now, uh, maybe you used to have road rage. Maybe you used to get really angry. But you've noticed that 
now you have a little more patience with people and you don't get as angry as you used to or that the way you talk has changed. Maybe your, your response to people used to be to drop a few F-bombs on them and now you know God has really cleaned up your language and it was a gradual thing so you didn't notice the difference but now you can sit and look back and say, wow, God has really made some changes in my life. Um, but just, I just want to remind you, don't ignore the small things because they mean something. They really do mean something. But we're going to take some time here. If you want to throw some stuff in the chat box, if you have questions, if there are some questions you had that maybe you feel like weren't answered, um, we're going to stick around for about 15 minutes after this to answer those questions for you. There's no such thing as a stupid question, so please feel free to ask whatever is on your heart. We want to make sure that you leave um, here feeling more secure in your salvation, knowing for sure that you're saved, because God wants you to know that, um, and that we've taken the time to properly answer your questions. We're also going to give you some resources. There are a couple of books that are going to show up on your screen. I'm going to grab something real quick, if you give me a second. Leah, can you talk for me? Yeah, so um, as Jay said, we're going to pop up some resources, and he's getting one of those now. And um, we encourage you to go to those, but also ask any questions. As Jay said, there's really no stupid question Unless of it's, you know, where Jay get his shoes. I mean. Stupid question. Just kidding. Yeah, just They're great shoes. They look, sna they look really sn snazzy. 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 Yeah. She's calling me old. <laughs> it's cool. So I, I grabbed this Who I Am in Christ pamphlet. And we actually have these here at the church. And I'm holding this one up because it really kind of walks you through a bunch of places in Scripture. As you can see it unfold. It walks you through a bunch of places in Scripture where you can see who you are in Christ. This new you. This new identity. And so if you would like one of these, I'm going to ask you to email me at info at pointharbor.com and just say, hey, Jay, send me one of those pamphlets, Who I Am in Christ, and I'll mail one of these to you um, just so you can have it and just kind of read through and begin to learn who you are in Christ and what he's really done for you because he's made you new. Um, you are new in the blood of Jesus, and so we want to make sure that you have a proper understanding in that because one of the things that hinders most believers from really feeling or living out God's best here on earth is that they have no idea who they truly are in Christ. You have a new identity. And if you're not willing to walk in that new identity, you're going to struggle. You know, if you, some of you may have grown up as orphans, um, you may have had a rough childhood, but you know, when you're brought into a new family, that gives you a new identity with a new inheritance, with new benefits. Um, and if you don't take full advantage of those, you're never going to experience life's best. And so we want you to experience the best you can in Christ here on earth. So you need to know who you are in him. So just take a moment. We're, like I said, we're going to hang out here. So ask questions, ask away. We'd love to answer questions for you. Um, we have a study in the Bible core class coming up next. Um, so the way the schedule is working, I believe you should see it next Thursday in about a week or so. Um, if that date changes, you can always go to pointharbor.com forward slash events to check out times and dates for our core classes. Uh, but yeah, we'd love to see you in another class and just have the opportunity to talk to you and walk you through God's word. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Peace. Bye.